Okay, well, I've got three o'clock, so I'm just going to say hello to everyone. My name is Jennifer. I'm with the Bangor Public Library. Uh, thank you for joining us on Zoom and Facebook for our rhubarb use and preservation demonstration. Uh, we have Lori Bowen and Kathy Savoy from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. I'd like to thank them and the University of Maine Co-op for working with us to bring you these programs. Uh, it's something new to all of us, and we're very grateful for the collaboration. We'll be hosting another virtual demonstration with Lori on July 24th on food preservation. Uh, if you're interested in attending, we'll be sending out a follow-up email that will include a link to register. Uh, there'll also be a brief survey and the resources that are mentioned. Uh, we are recording this tonight, so it'll be on YouTube if you'd like to look back on it, and there will be two question and answer periods. So I'll hand this over to Lori so she can start. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm amazed at the number of folks that expressed an interest in food preservation and I'm quite happy about it as well. Uh, as Jennifer said, my name is Lori Bowen. I'm a community education assistant for the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. We're also very fortunate today because we have Kathy Savoy joining us. She's an extension educator with a wealth of knowledge and experience in home food preservation. And she's joining us to answer your questions today. So we're, we're very lucky to have her. So before we get started, thinking about all of this interest in um, food preservation, I wanted to tell you all about some new programming that we have um, through the Cooperative Extension. Um, the first thing is we know a lot of people are planting gardens for the first time with the goal of preserving some of that food. So we have a short pre-recorded video series. It's called Victory Garden for Maine. Um, and the last video in this series that's coming up is gonna be focused on preserving the harvest. So we're quite excited about that. And if you go to extension.umaine.edu, click on the gardening info tab, that'll lead you to um, the information on how to view those videos. So today's program is an example of the new formats that we're using um, to provide education for folks on food preservation. So every Tuesday at 2 p.m., we have a weekly webinar and it's a different food preservation topic, and it also focuses on a main food. So again, if you go to extension.umaine.edu, go to the food preservation tab, you're gonna find a list of upcoming topics, how to register and access to previous webinars and a whole lot of other information. It's a great website, so take a look at that. And again, with food preservation, we have another new program. It's a mentoring program. Folks who are new to food preservation will be paired with a master food preserver who can guide them through their food preservation projects. So this is open to Maine residents. Um, for more information, you can contact Kate McCarty and her number is 781 6099 or kate at maine.edu. That is on our website, but also it's going to be in your follow-up email with the resources. So if you didn't catch it, it will be in the follow-up email. <clears throat> and last but not least, um, as Jennifer said, you can join us here again on July 24th at 1030. We're going to do a preserving the harvest. And it's going to be a demonstration on canning equipment, blanching, an overview of water bath canning, and information on registering for that will be in your follow-up email. I wonder how many times I can say that in your follow-up email. So, so Candace, do you mind bringing up that second slide so I can go over today's topics? Sure. Thank you. There we are. Okay, so today we're going to talk about safe practices for food preservation. We're going to do a demonstration on freezing rhubarb. We're going to talk about uses of rhubarb and some recipes, different methods for preserving rhubarb, 
And again, more resources and programs that are available to everyone. So if we can go to the third slide and it's titled Safety Tips. Okay. One of the most common things that I hear from people attending workshops is that they want the food they preserve to be safe. You know, and that's music to my ears. That's what everybody wants. We want a safe product. So we follow the most current USDA recommendations for preserving food at home. And another tip is only use tested recipes from reputable sources. That's key. Um, when I say reputable sources, I'm talking about places like the Cooperative Extension, the USDA. Um, they have a complete guide to home canning that is an excellent book. There's the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Another publication is So Easy to Preserve, and that's from the University of Georgia. And there are ball blue books. I'm sure you've seen them. <laughs> and the majority of those publications um, can be found at our publications website. And again, that's going to be in your follow up email. <laughs> so the fourth slide rhubarb specific safety tips. I'm sure everyone knows, but just to go over that again, that. Um, the leaves and the roots of rhubarb should never be eaten. Um, they do contain a toxin. So we're gonna discard the leaves and if we accidentally harvest some of the roots. Um, you can safely compost them, that's fine. There's no issue with that. Also keep in mind um, that rhubarb is highly acidic. So you may have some reactions um, to some metals like aluminum. Okay, let's talk about harvesting rhubarb, and that's the fifth slide. Well, hang on, there we go. <laughs> all right, great. So, we all love rhubarb, otherwise we wouldn't be here today, but rhubarb, of course, is one of the first crops available in the spring. And I think that's one of the reasons why we all like it so much. After a long winter, you know, we've got that fresh tart taste. Um, but it also contains vitamin C and calcium. So it's, it's good for us, which makes it even better. Um, the only drawback is many recipes will suggest a fair amount of sugar. Um, so what you can do is combine the stalks with sweeter fruits, like strawberries or blueberries, so you don't need quite as much sugar, if any. And, you know, if you're trying to cut down on your sugar, that's very helpful. So what are we looking for in rhubarb? Um, we're looking for bright, crisp stalks. We want to avoid using woody or wilted stalks. And I don't know if anyone has ever um, done this before, but if you cut the stalk that the flower grows up, it's hollow inside. And so we definitely want to avoid using those. That's not what we're looking for. Um, funny enough, the color of the rhubarb doesn't affect the taste. It doesn't matter if it's that bright red or the green. Um, it's still going to have that rhubarb tart taste. So to give you an idea of how much you will need to harvest or purchase if you, if you need to purchase for your planned projects, here are some estimates on yields. One pound of rhubarb will make about four cups or quarts of cut up rhubarb. Keep in mind, not all stocks are going to be the same size, of course. But um, it's, it's a rough estimate. It'll help give you an idea. And I'll hold it up again in a moment. But just to try and give you a visual, um, this is a pound. What I'm holding in my hand right here is a pound of rhubarb. So um, for the visual folks out there that, you know, that means more than my measurements. Keep that in mind. Um, root core stalks. 
of rhubarb, and that's going to be a pretty good sized stalk. We'll give you about two cups of diced rhubarb. You know, and again, that's a rough estimate, but it gives you an idea. We also want to keep in mind, though, if we are harvesting from our own plants, you know, we don't want to harvest those first year plants. And um, for sure, we don't want to harvest more than half the stalks of any individual plant um, through the whole summer. And for a cutoff date, you can use August 31st um, as the final harvest date. You want the plant to have time to prepare for winter. So that's a good time to stop the harvesting. If you are harvesting from your own plants, you can reach in, you twist, and you pull the stalk. And that's how you remove the stalk. If you would rather use a knife, you can use a knife to cut it off at the base. Now, if you need to purchase rhubarb, um, you don't have your own plants, the Cooperative Extension has created, it's an interactive map and it'll help you find the farm products that you're looking for. And that link is also going to be on your resource list. Um, Candace, do you have that link or did we take that out? Uh, it, is it, uh, yes, I do have that link. Hang on just one second. Thanks. I just think that it's a great map and if you can um, take a look at it, you'll, you'll be more likely to use it. <laughs> Oh, that's the drying vegetables. I'm, I apologize for that. Oh, that's all right. Um, Let's see, right here. It's right here. I added the link in the comments on Zoom, too. Awesome. Here it is. But this gives you an idea um, so that as, as the preserving season goes on, when you're looking for products for your project, this will come in super handy for you to locate those farms that have produce available. Um, you never know, you might discover a new farm you never even knew was there on this, this map, but um, you can see there are a lot of resources on there. So. Okay, so we can go to um, the sixth slide and we're going to talk about the materials that we're going to need today. I'll go ahead and start reading them off while we're getting back to that slide. So of course we're going to need a clean work surface as well as clean hands. And somehow I managed to take over the video. There we go. Excellent. Um, so what we need for materials, as I said, clean work surface as well as clean hands. Um, we want high quality rhubarb. We don't want anything that has insect damage or is wilted, anything like that. We're going to need a cutting board, knife, freezer ready containers. And the key word there is freezer. We want heavyweight freezer bags or rigid freezer cartons, freezer jars, or heavy duty freezer foil. We don't want to use anything like plastic bags or yogurt containers or regular grade foil. We need freezer grade um, material. Another thing that can be optional, but that is handy to have is a salad spinner. Um, that is optional. A baking tray, and that's optional as well. A produce brush if needed. Well, I needed it on mine, on a couple of those, so I included that. And a measuring cup. So if you want to 
come back to me. We'll go ahead and get started with our demonstration. Okay. So we have a clean work surface and clean hands. I've already done some prep. I've removed the leaves from the rhubarb. As I said, I've washed them um, and trimmed the ends. And again, it's fine to put those leaves in the compost pile. But um, I did, as I said, I did need a produce brush on a couple of these and um, that came in really handy, but I only washed these in water. I didn't use any type of detergent that's not necessary. So, but again, I think you can see a little bit better and maybe if I hold it up, um, this is a pound. I, I weighed it, it's a pound exactly. And um, so we know what we're working with. So sometimes when we are harvesting, we're like, oh, that's just so much. And then by the time we remove the leaves and from the ends, it's like, oh, that's not enough. So, um, so I'm gonna be cutting this batch in about one inch chunks. And that's because I'm going to use it for things like my barbecue sauce and my um, preserving projects later on. And the larger chunks are okay because they're gonna cook down as, as they heat up. If I were making sweet breads or muffins, <clears throat> pardon me, muffins, things like that, I could even do a quarter inch to a half inch even. So I am gonna make pretty big chunks and See, I'm planning ahead, like I said. I'm, you know, I'm thinking ahead to the barbecue sauces and the sweets. And I'm going to label my bags to indicate what I've put in them. That's key. I'll try to say that again. So let's go ahead. Now I'm going to look away because um, I really want to keep my fingers. So I'm going to stop looking at the camera right now. And I just want to put a plug in for nice safety. I'm sure you're all very aware, but we wanna make a cloth. We wanna make sure those fingers are out of the way. Don't, don't anyone be insulted. That's just a pet thing of mine that I always worry about nice safety. So, so I think you all can see, but I'll move, I'm gonna move these out of the way. We can take a few and put them together. Of course, they're never gonna be the same. I think this is like when you're cutting wood, you always end up with odd pieces at the end of the log. And this is the same thing. I will say that the smaller pieces are less ready, I'll call them. If you're familiar with celery, how celery can be um, really fibrous. So, the larger pieces, for sure, do have a lot more fiber um, in them. I don't mean fiber, but just stringy. Have my measuring cup ready. I'm gonna go ahead and put these in, but I know when I'm gonna get the two cups. We'll test my theory if we have that yield amount. I was making this barbecue sauce earlier and it just smelled so good in here. It's like, it just inspires you to start cooking and baking and get ready. And then I'm sure when I go outside and it's 90 plus degrees, I'll change my mind by the time I get home. But the thing about freezing the rhubarb is it's gonna be ready for later use. So I'm gonna move that. I'm sure it's quite boring to watch me chop here. So we're gonna call this, for demonstration purposes, we're gonna call this two cups. And I'm pretty darn close, so we'll just make it official. Now, at this point, I can take my freezer grade bag, it's labeled, it has its contents, it's ready to go, and I can place the rhubarb in here. Or if I feel like there's a lot of water still 
on it from washing. I can get my salad spinner out and put my rhubarb in there and give it a good spin. I think the salad spinner is the unsung hero of food preservation. Um, I use my salad spinner for a, a lot of preserving projects for sure. Um, this rhubarb did not have a lot of moisture left on it, but I just wanted to give you an example of um, how, how to use it and how well it works. So now I'm going to place all of the rhubarb. I've already measured it, but I know it's two cups. I'm going to place it into my freezer bag. And I am going to get as much air out of here as possible. We don't want any excess air. However, you can get the air out and make sure you have a very, very good seal on this. Now, the other thing to keep in mind though, is even though I'm putting my rhubarb in and it's measured, I want to make sure I don't exceed two thirds full in whatever kind of container that I have because I need to leave what they call headspace. And that's so that the food inside has room to expand as it freezes. And that doesn't apply to just this. You're going to hear that phrase in canning projects. Even if you were freezing berries, you still need to leave headspace. So that's very important. Now, I'm going to take this right back out because I want to demonstrate something else. Now, this is the tray method. I really like this method myself. Um, I like it because um, I think things hold their shape a little bit better, which is appealing to me visually when I'm preserving, which is um, unusual. But um, what you can do in the tray method is instead of placing this in your bag or a freezer container, put all of your rhubarb on the tray, spread it out so that it's in one layer. You don't want it overlapping. Place this in the freezer for 24 hours. Allow it to freeze really well. Then you can come back to it and then place it in your bag. Same method. You want to make sure you get out as much air as possible. But, <clears throat> and again, you could have um, put this in the salad spinner too. It would have reduced the number of ice crystals and things that form. But this, this is the tray method. And you can use this on other things that you're freezing as well, whether it be um, strawberries or blueberries or whatever is currently in season. But I like the tray method. I recommend it. I'm going to set this over here. Actually, uh, that reminds me, we want to put things in the freezer as quickly as possible. We want them to start freezing. So um, rather than setting that on the um, counter, I should have put that directly into the freezer. So let's see. Um, we've covered the whole process, but I do want to talk about um, some freezer etiquette, if you will. Um, it's important you don't overload your freezer. Overloading slows down the whole freezing process um, or freezing rate, and that can affect quality. So a good rule of thumb is two to three pounds per cubic foot of available storage space in your freezer. So um, I'm sure you know what size um, uh, freezer that you have. Figure out what you have for available space and then keep that in mind. Um, you freeze foods as soon as they're packaged and sealed, as I said, and you leave a little space between the packages so that the air can circulate because you want that to freeze as quickly as possible. And once you have that food, food frozen, you can store the packages close together, but for that initial freezing, um, give them a little room. And add only what you're going to be able to freeze, like I said, within 24 hours. Again, that's two to three pounds per cubic foot. Um, 
So let's see, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but um, we have time to take some questions now, probably um, I would say it's about 10 minutes of those questions and I'll go ahead and I'll prep for the next segment. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Candice and Jennifer and Kathy. Okay, so we do have some questions coming through on Facebook. Oh, can you hear me? I think I muted you. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Let me get back over there. We have one from Janet. She asked, how long can it be frozen for? So rhubarb is um, recommended to be used from your freezer within eight months. And that's really a quality issue. It's not a food safety issue. It's not like if you go beyond that to 10 months that there's gonna be a, a food safety issue or a compromise there. So it's just about quality. Okay, and then Sandra asks, can you peel the rhubarb before freezing? So um, some people might be confused by peeling of rhubarb, but um, in my experience, the older, um, tougher stalks of rhubarb tend to have a stringiness to them that oftentimes if you're slicing them with maybe not the sharpest knife in the world, which is often the case in my kitchen, um, you will end up with those strings. Um, they're not necessarily a, a peel, but they are um, some more fibrous tissue that you can remove from the rhubarb if you wish to. Rest assured that it will cook down. Um, and of course, most of our recipes that we use rhubarb with is cooked, um, but you, you can go ahead and take it off. Okay, and then someone asked, where can we buy rhubarb? So I would encourage you to um, look at that agricultural um, directory that University of Maine Cooperative Extension with numerous partners have pulled together and see if there are local um, farm stands, farmers markets near you where you could access rhubarb. Okay. That would be the best bet. And we did put the links to everything that's mentioned in the comments on Facebook. So you'll find that in there. Okay. Um, Cheryl asks, what size is too small to harvest? So typically if it's smaller than your pinky size, it really hasn't developed to the level of maturity that you want it to be at. Uh, give it a few more days. Certainly weather like this is going to um, help to get your rhubarb growing quickly. Um, so just give it a few days if it's too small. Okay, and Eleonora is asking, even when I used freezer bags, mine got freezer burn, why? So there's lots of different reasons why that may happen. Um, and uh, oftentimes people um, see ice crystals and think that it is freezer burn. Um, that may or may not be the case. Ice crystals are simply ice crystals that can form from extra water. Um, whereas freezer burn really has a different color to it and adheres to the surface of the food. Um, it kind of, if you will, looks a little bit like a, like a scab. Um, and it does have um, some off flavors that do develop as well as odors. Um, but ice crystals, again, can simply form in the bag as a result of extra moisture that you may have um, in your product. You know that fruits, fruits and vegetables are very, um, you know, they have a high water content anyways. Um, and then if you do have a freezer compartment that is um, self um, defrosting, sometimes those have cycles in them where um, depending on if your food is near it, it can cause it to partially thaw a little bit and then develop those ice crystals. Okay, we have another question from Jan. If you make a strawberry rhubarb syrup juice, how long can that be frozen for? So, oh, that sounds delicious, first of all. <laughs> um, so we would have a recommendation that that be used 
And again, it's, it's about quality. It's not about safety because technically things can be frozen forever. Um, their quality just deteriorates over time. So if I had a strawberry rhubarb syrup or juice that I had frozen, um, I would recommend using that within a year. And again, it's a quality issue, not a food safety issue. Okay, Eleanor says, thank you. And then Megan is asking, how do I cultivate wild rhubarb to grow in my home garden? Okay, so um, we were talking, you know, rhubarb is, I, I, I encourage you to take a look around your, your neighborhood. Um, oftentimes you can find it in your neighbor's own backyard. And although I'm not a horticulture person, I do have an ex experience in um, getting rhubarb transplants from friends and starting my own um, rhubarb patch in my garden. And yeah, I would encourage you to find a rhubarb plant from someone who you know that it is rhubarb. We'd hate to have anyone, um, you know, mistake a different type of plant in the woods for what they assume could be um, an edible food. They're very easy to transplant. Even I could do it. Let's see. Are more comments. Hold on, they're not showing. Uh, Lynette is asking, how do I transplant rhubarb? So University of Maine Cooperative Extension does have a lovely fact sheet on growing rhubarb in your backyard. And I'm sure that that will be included as one of the resources to this webinar. And Megan says, thank you. They like a lot of sun and they like to be fertilized. I do know that. Um, Penelope was asking, did Lori say that we should only pick partial stalks and not all the rhubarb at once on Zoom? Lori, did you want to go ahead and answer that one? She's trying to unmute, I think. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I did talk about how much that you should harvest because um, we don't want to deplete the plant too, too much. Um, but when I was talking about um, the hollow stalks, um, those are the ones that have probably been flowering and maybe got um, missed. But um, for instance, let's see, um, you don't want to, um, harvest more than the plant can take. So um, let's see, just trying to go back and collect my thoughts because I can't remember now what I told you. Um, I was thinking about barbecue sauce. You hold on just a second and I will get that back for you. Um, okay. Um, here it is. So you, we don't harvest from our first year plants for sure at all. They need time to build up. Um, we don't harvest more than half of the entire plant throughout the season because that would just deplete it too much. And um, use August 31st as a stop date for harvesting anymore. Okay, and then there was, I think Sue wanted a little clarification. Um, she was questioning, you can't compost the leaves, but can you compost the flowers? No, you can compost the leaves quite safely. Um, and you can, you can put that whole, the flower and all in your compost pile. Okay, and then Bruce was just commenting that he throws all of the extra stuff, including flowers, into the compost pile. And he asked, have you tried vacuum M packages, packagers for freezing? I have not. Kathy, have you? Yeah, um, I teach the Master Food Preserver class here in Maine, and that is one of the activities that we do in that class is to use the commercial vacuum sealers and, you know, there are some nice features to those in that they do help to remove the air in the bag 
which again helps um, in combination with using a freezer grade container to reduce that um, vapor moisture exchange that can occur. And again, just kind of deteriorate the quality of your product. Um, it's not a food safety issue. Um, so there are a lot of good things about uh, one of those vacuum sealers. Um, some of the other things to keep in mind are that you do need to um, purchase their particular bag products. Um, so you are making an, a long-term investment in needing to, to purchase those in the future. And you know, like a lot of this specialty equipment, it, it does take up room in your kitchen. So plan ahead for where you would want to store something like that. Okay, then we have a question coming in through Facebook. Um, Mary Ellen's asking, is there a best time of day to harvest? So again, not a hort horticulture person, I could make a guess at it, but I'll pass this over to Lori to see if, if, if she has a, a better answer. Um, of course, on a day like today in the heat, um, there is no good time. I think it was already 80 when we got up this morning. Mm -hmm. But um, like most things, if you can harvest in the morning um, after the dew is off, if it's a, if it's a really dewy day, but um, not in the, the heat of the day because that plant's already going to be stressing with the heat. So yeah. um, I, if you, I would say like mid-morning is a good time. All right, I'll just do one more and then we can save the rest of the questions for the end too, because I think we pretty much got most of them. Um, Sandra's asking, can you peel the rhubarb before freezing? So um, you, you can, and again, it's not necessarily peeling, it's just kind of removing those coarse fibrous stringy sections that may be uh, uh, on the rhubarb if it is a more mature um, stock of rhubarb. So you can, you, you do not have to. Thank you. So um, I apologize for missing the time um, for the suggested storage time. And I like that word stringy. I'm gonna use that from now on instead of my fiber word. Um, I think it, it's a lot more fitting. Um, <clears throat> so everybody in my family, when we talk about rhubarb, immediately talk about sweet. And they are talking about um, all those awesome desserts made from rhubarb, like strawberry rhubarb pie, uh, rhubarb cookies and crumbles and all of that. And they're great. I love them. Don't get me wrong at all. But um, I think there's more to rhubarb that we might be missing. And I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, in the bulletin that Kathy mentioned, um, growing rhubarb in Maine, there is you will be receiving that in your resource list. And in that resource, there is a link to the rhubarb compendium. And they have a lot of recipes like um, rhubarb stuffing, um, baked chicken with rhubarb. I mean, there are some really great recipes in there. So don't miss that as you're going through the bulletin because that's a great resource. Um, and that, if you, if you want to reference it, it is bulletin 2514, but if you just um, find the growing rhubarb in Maine, there's a link right there. So. so I wanted to talk about some savory uses for rhubarb. And um, of course, this is the time of year where I'm all about grilling and whatnot. So I had barbecue sauce on the brain. And um, so I found this really fun um, rhubarb barbecue sauce. And it's, <clears throat> pardon me, it's from Illinois Extension, and it's adapted from a recipe from a Ball Blue book. And so it was also an opportunity for me to use my frozen rhubarb, because I don't need to thaw that first in order to use it. So I've got my rhubarb. <laughs> And here's my additional frozen rhubarb. And I'm just gonna throw that right in. So I need my chopped raisins. I don't know if y'all can see. And 
Then we have our chopped onion. This is gonna be good, you guys. It is gonna be so yummy. And we have, let's see, we have our brown sugar. So we're gonna throw that in as well. And I almost threw the whole bowl in, so that wouldn't have been fun. And of course we have vinegar, because we need vinegar to go with that. Now I have all my spices ready to go, but we're gonna go ahead and let this cook down and just add our spices in the last five minutes. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll start this. As it cooks down, as we were talking about the stringies, I did notice that um, my stringies showed up even more in the barbecue sauce because I did have some older stocks in there when I made the recipe earlier. So my solution was blended it. I just um, used a blender and chopped all that up and it, it worked great. So through the magic of television, I think you have to be my age to appreciate that term, but through the magic of television, here is my delicious rhubarb barbecue sauce. Now I don't wanna mislead anybody and think that this is um, a preserved in a water bath can or anything like that. No, I did not do that. I just had this handy with a screw top, so I'm using it. So let's take a look. At just how delicious and it smells really good I wish we had smell-o-vision take a look at this barbecue sauce now I will warn you as this starts to thicken you really do need to watch it so it doesn't burn on but how easy is it just to throw your frozen rhubarb in there so the color is a little brown I'm not sure if that's a good visual but it's brown, but it's because of the brown sugar and the raisins. And then of course, you know, you have that rhubarb in there. But I guess I'm just encouraging everyone to really think outside of your usual recipes because there are so many uses for the rhubarb. And this is such an easy method to preserve it. I mean, chop, put it away in the bag or on the tray and you're set. You don't need to do anything else. And then it's so easy to use again. So I just wanted to share that little bit with you. And the recipe I think is included as well in the resources. Um, the recipe does make quite a bit, but at this time of year when we're all grilling and whatnot, it could get used up pretty quickly. Okay. So, um, can you bring up our sixth slide, Candace? Do you mind doing that? It's the other ways to preserve rhubarb. Okay. So some other ways um, that we can preserve rhubarb one is, and you'll see this, and I wanted to talk about it because I was concerned you might see these in some of the recipe books and then wonder why I didn't talk about it. But you can blanch before you freeze. Um, you're, you're, like I said, you'll see some instructions that call for blanching. Um, blanch for one minute in boiling water, and then you cool it right away in cold water. Um, it will help retain color and flavor um, there's other um, produce like onions or peppers that you can um, skip the step of blanching as well. But I think that I am so happy with my product of rhubarb by the method I showed you that I don't think I'm um, motivated to go ahead with the blanching. But we'll, we'll check in with Kathy, get her take on that, see if um, her experience has been that it made a significant difference. But um, we can, we'll check back with it with her in a minute here after I go through the other one. Now, of course, there's canning. Um, that's the simplest, um, the simplest canning process for rhubarb is a hot pack method. And you add a half a cup of sugar per quart of rhubarb and you process it in um, a water bath 
for 15 minutes and that's for pints or quarts. Um, that's pretty much the most straightforward recipe that I know of. Um, and that's, you know, like I said, that's gonna be an actual canning. That's not freezing your product. So one thing that I never think about when I think about preserving my rhubarb is drying it. Now, rhubarb is um, a vegetable, but it's treated like a fruit. So I wanted to play you, uh, play you the video that um, Kate McCarty did um, for extension on drying vegetables. Um, can, we, can we go ahead and play that, Candace? Hi, I'm Kate McCarty, Food Preservation Program Aid at University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Dehydrating or drying fruit is a great way to create your own snacks at home while controlling the amount of added sugar. Take advantage of local or homegrown fruit and preserve them using an electric dehydrator. Solar dehydrating is not recommended in Maine because of our high humidity levels and low nighttime temperatures. To dehydrate fruit, you'll need an electric dehydrator, a cutting board, a knife, and a peeler. Materials to store dry fruit in need to be airtight and made of plastic or glass. Rinse fruit and peel as needed, then slice into equal sized pieces. To dry whole fruits, like berries, dip into boiling water for 15 to 30 seconds or until the skin splits. Spread fruit pieces on dehydrator trays, making sure to avoid overlap. Dehydrate at 140 degrees Fahrenheit until dry. Fruit pieces are dry when they are still flexible, but do not stick to themselves when folded in half. This can take anywhere from 12 to 36 hours, depending on the types of fruit you're drying and how thick the pieces are. Dry fruit thoroughly to avoid spoilage. You can also create a low sugar fruit leather by blending fruit like berries with applesauce as a healthy alternative to store-bought fruit snacks. To store your dried fruit, pack it into an airtight plastic or glass container and store in a cool, dark, dry place. To learn more about dehydrating food, visit University of Maine Cooperative Extension's website. I just wanted to talk about the drying of rhubarb just a little bit. Um, in this so easy to preserve um, recipe book, um, they have a list of vegetables, vegetables and fruits, and they give it a classification whether it's considered good for drying, excellent, or fair, and like that. Well, rhubarb, when it comes to drying, um, is considered good. So that's uh, I guess that's like a B plus, I don't know. Um, and it's only fair though, if you wanna make any kind of like the fruit leathers with them. But what I'm thinking really is, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that is an option. But again, I think that the method we demonstrated is going to be the easiest method. Um, and I don't know, I think it would be the fastest as well. So I would be aware there are other methods and find you know what suits your particular project, project. but I think that we have demonstrated what is gonna be the easiest for you. I think we left off on Facebook. Cindy asked, what season do you split or transplant? Did I oh. get that one last time? Oh, it's better if you can do it um, in the spring, give the plant that time to get established. Um, and it should be done every four to five years. You know, you want to keep that size um, in control, so to speak. Okay. Um, and Kathy commented that she has seen rhubarb plants for sale at Sprague's in Bangor. Uh, Cheryl is asking, is there a specific pH of soil that rhubarb likes? My chickens seem to love hanging out in my patch and are fertilizing freely. <laughs> I think they like it because of the shade. I think they're, if they're like mine, they're sneaking in there for the shade and the dirt. But um, yeah, rhubarb kind of likes an acidic soil. Um, it, it doesn't require it, but it won't bother it. So. Um, I can look up the pH exactly for you. I think it's right in our bulletin there, growing rhubarb in Maine. Um, I know I saw that it likes, 
And it likes um, a pH range from 5.0 to 6.8. So there you go. Thank you. You're welcome. And Emily's asking two questions. One, how long can the rhubarb be ready to harvest before you actually harvest it? How long? Kathy, I need help on that if you can sure. argue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll jump right in. So you can, you know, harvest your rhubarb from your plant and, you know, you can clean it off and refrigerate it. And as long as you get it in your freezer or use it within seven days, you'll be fine. So oftentimes I know I find myself, you know, out busy outside and then get inside and don't, don't necessarily have the energy to put everything away or up that I may have gathered. So rest assured, you can, um, you know, wash it off, get it in your, you know, a, a, a bag of some sort to help retain the moisture and keep it in your refrigerator for up to seven days before you freeze it or use it. And then the second part of her question asks, if the rhubarb bolts, can you still harvest it? We get this question a lot. <laughs> um, so I know that, uh, you know, the recommendation or somewhat, this is somewhat controversial, right, Laurie? Whether or not you should cut the flower off. Um, and we're not very definitive in our bulletin about it. You know, we acknowledge <laughs> in our bulletin that some people feel very strongly one way and others the other way. Um, how about I weigh in with my personal opinion? Okay, M my personal opinion um, is that I would cut that stalk. And the reason being is because it's hollow. And in my experience at my house, it is a critter house. So I don't want to keep that there. You know, I even consider the fact if it's, you know, developing seed, less energy is going into the root of the plant. Um, I do follow that thought, but um, my concern more has been about, you know, the earwigs and the different critters that like that environment. So personally, I do cut the stalk that has the, the flower seed on it. Yeah. And again, I'm not a horticulturist, but I, I do cut the flower stalk as well and have the same rationale as Lori that it helps to put the energy back into the plant. Okay and then Brenda is asking if we keep cutting off the seed pods will it last um, and I think it's how much longer will it season? Actually it will. Um, the, the propagation isn't really from the seeds, you're not guaranteed if you propagate from seed that you're gonna get the same plant that you got, that you that you started with. Um, so yes, it will continue. I think what keeps the plant healthiest is that making sure that you're dividing it every four to five years so that you have, you know, new, new petioles and things always developing. Okay, and Doug is asking, do you cut rhubarb or pull the stalks? I have heard do not cut. And do you have to break up the roots periodically? So I'll answer about the roots every four to five years. Kathy, do you wanna take about the pulling or cutting? Sure, and there's you know a couple, two different schools of thought on that. Um, the, the twisting helps to remove the rhubarb right from the actual kind of bulbous base of the plant. Um, so you're not leaving so much of an open area um, of the rhubarb plant. If you do cut it, you know, you've got kind of that open spot, open access to the plant. Um, I, I don't think that there's a huge difference either way. Um, so, you know, you can choose to, to approach with either method how you're going to cut down all that uh, lovely rhubarb that hopefully you have in your, your backyard or your neighbor's backyard. See, I've never had an issue with um, a scarcity of rhubarb. Right. And I must be fortunate, but it seems like I always had someone that was like, hey, you want some rhubarb? And they're, you know, they're willing to share. So um, I guess I've been very fortunate and didn't realize it. Okay, and then Amy is asking, is there a site you like for recipes? All of them. 
<laughs> um, I like our site best, to be honest. Um, it's um, it's got some really good good recipes and different varieties, um, and I don't know. I don't. I don't think. Right after that, I think I'm just open to pretty much everything. Kathy, do you have a you have a fave? Um, no, I don't have a favorite, but I would say that um, in the past few years, some of the recipes that I've tried have been in that savory line of things that you mentioned, Lori, as far as challenging my palate to move beyond um, the sugar the loaded sweetness of a lot of the rhubarb recipes. Um, so again, exploring the, the, the savory world of rhubarb. I have tried the um, website that you mentioned, the rhubarb compendium. Compendium, yes. And I have um, tried a lovely, I think it was a rhubarb ginger scone recipe that I found mm -hmm. there, which was indeed lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, Francine is asking, how can we obtain the links at the end of the webinar if we're watching the Facebook site? Um, and I can answer that. If you registered and we have your email, we'll send them in the follow-up email. If you didn't get to register and want to just email us or uh, send us a private message on Facebook, we can send you that follow-up email as well. Um, let's see, Kim is asking, how do we clean up the rhubarb bed in the fall? Cut or leave remaining stalks? I don't recommend, and also our growing rhubarb in Maine um, recommends you clean up in the fall once the frost has killed the rhubarb. Um, and that's in an effort to control pests mostly um, because, you know, that's it's like a pest hotel for them with those big stocks there, so. Okay. Um, and then Becky's asking, should we break off the flowers if allowed to bloom? Does this make the rhubarb not good to use? Again, those stocks with the flowers, um, I should have saved one, actually. Let me look. Just hold on one second. Um, Okay, no. while you're doing that, uh, Terry did ask, how do we access the bulletins mentioned? And again, that would be in the follow-up email or you can PM us your email address and we can add you to that list. Or they are in the Facebook comments. All right, sorry, Lori. No, that's all right. I, I guess I, I threw it away, but I did bring in a couple of those flower stalks so that I could show you that they're like a piece of bamboo. They're like totally hollow. And it's nothing you want to use anyway. So um, that's another reason why I'm of the thought of just clearing it off. Um, I, I think that's your best option. And um, so what, um, don't, don't bother Candace putting up that, that last slide that just had my contact information on it. Um, but I just want to um, take a quick minute and thank Kathy for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you attending and answering all these questions for us. Um, <clears throat> you, if you go to the food preservation website, you're gonna have all that contact information there. It's also in the resource information as well. Um, I don't, I don't think that I, have anything posted on our web page um, as far as contacting me but um, if you have any questions or we didn't get to your question today please feel free to um, send me an email or leave me a voicemail that voicemail will go directly to my email so I will get it um, even though our office is um, currently closed our phones are set up that it turns into an email and we get them though we're working from home. So, but um, and I also want to thank Candace and Jennifer. I had a great time today. I can't wait till we do our next um, Zoom meeting slash Facebook Live. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yes, and well, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Kathy. Um, there was one question that I was wondering too. 
can you can the barbecue sauce? You can. Um, and I didn't want to get into that whole thing, but that recipe and the recipe in the Ball Blue Book um, both have their processing times and instructions there. And it is um, a reputable recipe that has been tested. It says that it's been tested right on it. And it is um, an extension um, recipe. So um, yes, that recipe includes your instructions if you would like to can it. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you everybody for coming today or watching on Facebook. Um, I guess that's it. Thanks everybody, happy canning. Bye.